It is a great pleasure that we can uh, we can welcome you at the Prague Game Meetup with Michael Bowling. Um, your composition clearly shows that uh, our efforts to uh, foster a diverse community bear fruit. Uh, there are countless uh, computer scientists, needless to say, about 60 students, 70 academic researchers, uh, 60 people have indicated that they've also ventured into the industry research world. Uh, quite a few uh, people from startups as well as, uh, as well as corporates, educators, investors, and other community builders. We are thrilled that uh, most of you intend to stay for the networking part, and we sincerely hope that uh, you will all uh, jump into um, beneficial and fun um, interactions and exchanges. Um, our initiative Prague AI arose from a belief that uh, through collaboration among uh, many stakeholders, we can actually achieve our ambitious vision to transform Prague into a formidable AI hub. And uh, um, this event is certainly a result of a collaborative effort. I would like to take this opportunity to introduce you to the Prague AI team, since uh, I'm the only last woman standing from the original composition. So uh, please meet uh, our new director, Lukáš Kačená, who's been with us. Um, who has been with us since uh, April and has been doing a fantastic job. And recently, we've been joined by two amazing ladies, uh, Petra and Bara over there, who are in charge... ..who are in charge of our um, community building and education efforts, and they've put all this event together. Um, we are uh, supported by a, um, a great bunch of industry partners, two of which uh, have kindly opened their wallets for tonight as well. So uh, one of them is Datacentix, an Atos company, uh, about 150 certified data experts who build um, AI and data products for smart retail, banking, manufacturing or healthcare. Uh, many of the uh, machine learning algorithms that power a combi have been actually developed in this very building. And thanks to the state of the, uh, the art research, this uh, Prague-based startup has uh, become one of the global leaders in uh, content and product uh, recommendations. Czech Invest, um, government agency, they've uh, recently launched an ambitious program designed for about 250 startups. They've allocated about 26 million euros. And uh, th this money for the next few years is designed not only for innovative companies, but also R&D uh, projects with market potential, uh, students as well as university spin-offs. So if Matouš Koslivi is here, I hope he is, he's over there, please do uh, definitely speak to him so this money is uh, spent wisely. And last but not least, uh, Impulse Ventures, uh, one of the Prague-based VC funds focused on Central and Eastern Europe, and they uh, invest into early stage startups. They are technology agnostic, but needless to say, they are very much interested in artificial intelligence. Uh, and some of their startups are, for example, Datadu, which you might have registered uh, recently, or Safetyka. Um, we had been planning um, a community event for quite some time, but um, it was a, a Canadian gentleman, or maybe more his uh, personal assistant, Melanie, who actually helped us to set the date for the event. Um, we don't mind a bit of that Canadian influence on our affairs since Prague AI, the idea for Prague AI was actually conceived in Canada uh, during uh, the kind of uh, uh, trip of our founding fathers who went there for inspiration. Uh, so it is a, a great honor that uh, Michael Bowling, um, professor at the University of Alberta and uh, research scientist at uh, a deep uh, mind, a world-renowned expert on many, many things, uh, artificial intelligence, reinforcement learning, multi-agent systems, uh, game theory, and much more, has um, kindly accepted our invitation to speak um, uh, here. Uh, tonight. Um, many of you may not be actually aware of the fact that uh, his uh, link to Prague is rather firmly established uh, through a company called Equilibrate Technologies, uh, 
uh, that was founded by two gentlemen, or maybe more gentlemen, sitting here tonight, uh, Matej uh, Moravčík and Martin Schmidt. And uh, they, um, and it, I suppose, is a result of their successful collaboration on Deep Stack back in 2016, 2017. Uh, Michael then went and snatched them off to Edmonton. Uh, but um, uh, I suppose that the boys were tired of Deep Mind, but of course, and decided to uh, establish their own startup. And they've come back to Prague to do it from Prague. So I think this is another testimony that uh, Prague has been uh, founded on a, a quality premise that actually Prague does have a lot to offer uh, to the global world of artificial intelligence. And without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Michael Bowling. Thank you very much, Lanka, for that nice introduction. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, I, I, I have uh, how to begin. I, uh, I was here five years ago, um, and uh, uh, I'm super excited to come back and to see Prague and the AI ecosystem grow is very exciting to me. Um, I'm very thankful that you let me borrow uh, three of your researchers, uh, in, in fact, for 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 almost uh, five years total. Uh, and then, and then they, I, I got to send them back to you, um, mostly unharmed. Um, and uh, I'm very thankful for the time we've gotten to do research together and excited for what they're going to do here on their next step of their journey. And I'm super excited here to see so many people that are also um, you know, passionate about what artificial intelligence can do. Uh, I think watching ecosystems grow is exciting because I think AI is the most transformative technology that humanity can ever imagine. And I think to see it have that transformation capacity, we need an ecosystem. We need all of you, whether you're in industry or whether you're in education, training the next generation of students, or whether you're a student now who's going to impact the world going forward. If we're going to change the world, we need everyone involved uh, to be successful at this. And so I'm excited to see this group here. Um, for the talk I'm going to give today, I want to talk about this, this idea of hindsight rationality, which is going to try to rethink uh, AI a little bit. Like I'm going to try to go at, at pretty fundamental questions about how we go about doing this endeavor. Um, and at parts, I'm going to try to get a little bit technical, but I'm hoping we can still keep everyone together. In order to do that, there's going to be various points in time where I'm going to pause and just open it up to questions. I'm not going to save them for the end. So, um, so I'm going to invite questions at a couple of different points along and talk. So if you could please go there. Um, we're going to use that for questions. So if you anticipate you're a kind of person who might ask questions, uh, please uh, go hit the website so you can be ready for when, uh, for when I'm ready to invite you into questions. Um, of course, if you have questions in the middle, I'm, I'm also happy to take them. Uh, let's see here. I have that backwards. Okay, perfect. Um, so actually, full talk is hindsight. Ra full title of the talk is hindsight rationality alternatives to Nash, which uh, a lot of this talk is going to come out of. Uh, work I've done in multi-agent systems and multi-agent learning, which is about how do we have agents that learn and can accomplish tasks when there's other agents in the world. And a lot of that work sits on some very foundational topics of Nash equilibria, and I'm not going to dive too much into details on what they are. So, so if the alternatives to Nash doesn't make any sense to you, that's going to be completely fine. I think the high-level ideas uh, should still come through. Um, this talk is based on two papers that had a number of co-authors, so I just want to uh, recognize them. Dustin Morrill is a PhD student for which this is largely his PhD dissertation. So once again, I get to run around the world talking about this exciting work uh, that Dustin did for the most part. Um, but this was a really great collaboration with Amy Greenwald at Brown um, and a student she was working with at MIT as well as with DeepMind. Um, so that's the origins of this. Okay, so I said I wanted to rethink sort of how AI happens. And so let's talk a little bit about what is the standard way that we sort of build agents that do really amazing things. Like many of you, of course, have heard of whether it's uh, you know agents that are playing Atari, Atari games better uh, than humans can, or playing Go better than humans can, or playing StarCraft better than humans can, or playing something else better than humans can. Um, you know, what does a lot of that look like? It sort of sits on this notion. I'm going to argue that it sits on a very very certain notion of rationality that is that sort of comes from way back in the day that says you're rational as an agent, as you, you know, all of you are agents, you're rational if you maximize rewards, some notion of utility, something you want to get, you maximize rewards with respect to your beliefs about the world. 
Okay, so fairly standard in the academic literature of what it means to be a rational agent. Um, so what does that mean for AI and how we've done AI? So I got Mr. Rational Agent here who's acting in the world. Here this is going to be a computer program and it's going to interact with the world, trying to do something in the world. This could be playing arcade games or maybe this is playing a, a board game or this is, uh, um, you know, trading crypto. Um, whatever might be happening. Here's my rational agent interacting with the world. And then the whole idea is we train this agent, right? The agent goes and takes actions in the world, gets observations back, gets some rewards, and tries to maximize those rewards and runs for a while. Like this is, we're training. And then when we're done, if you're sort of interested, if you know sort of the reinforcement learning nomenclature, out pops out pi star. This is the optimal policy. So we do this training bit, and when we're done, we pull out the policy, and we're excited. We take this policy, and we go play against Lisa Dahl, the best Go player in the world, and we defeat them, and it's very exciting. Um, and that's the idea, that we train our agents, and then we get out Pi Star. Okay, so that actually worked extremely well. That's how we approach Atari and many other things that I've already mentioned. Um, but we can move on to, like, we can think about these game settings. So Go is an example of a game setting for which well, it's not just about one agent interacting with the world. There's, there's another agent in the world. They're also interacting. So I take actions and they take actions. We both get rewards and, and, and observations. Um, so then how do we train agents in this case? Well, we just do the same thing, right? We take our agent and maybe we take another agent. Maybe it's just our agent again. And we'll have them play games together. They'll just play lots of games together. Uh, train for a very long time. Play billions and billions of games of Go. And then... You know, like, here's a much smaller game that they could play, uh, Rock, Paper, Scissors. Hopefully many of you know this game. I'm going to use this as one more example. But, but here is a very simple game they might play together where they just simply take a single action and get at a payoff from it. But they're going to play this game over and over and over again, and out pops out Pi Star. So in the case of Rock, Paper, Scissors, we might expect out pops out, like, the equilibrium of this game, which if you, you know, probably you're familiar with, like, the best thing to do if you're playing Rock, Paper, Scissors is to just play randomly. Because if you do anything else, then, then right, the other agent can maybe exploit that fact, say, if you're always playing Rock. Um, so we're going to have these agents play against each other, and then the goal would be out would pop out uh, Pi Star. And this is, in fact, how we largely trained uh, Deep Stack to play poker. It's how uh, uh, the Go agents were played, the StarCrafter agents were played. We go through this training process, out pops out Pi Star. Okay, let me point out the first problem with this. Oh, maybe, maybe I, should, I should first say why. Why does this work? So the reason this works is I told you about Pi Star being in, in Rock, Paper, Scissors is this random strategy. It, sort of in, in sort of the technical term for this is it is mini-max optimal. It says that in the worst case, I can't lose in the game of rock, paper, scissors if I play randomly. Uh, the nice thing about minimax optimal policies in two-player, zero-sum games, these are competitive games where you're playing as one other person, is that those strategies are interchangeable. If I find any minimax optimal strategy, regardless of what strategy the other player plays, I guarantee that I'm going to achieve this base minimum. And this is why this is an effective pi star to find. Okay, the first crack in the system arises when you think about what happens when there's more than two players, which is, of course, the normal case, not the unusual case. So, but what happens now when I have multiple, many, many people interacting together in the world, which might, you know, sort of be our real world? Well, we could hope to just do the same thing. We'll just have it. rational agents. They will play against each other. They will maximize rewards. Their beliefs will eventually become correct about what all the other agents are going to do. And up will, out will pop up Pi Star, which we might think of this as a Nash equilibrium if everyone's beliefs are consistent and they're all maximizing rewards. This would have to be a Nash equilibrium, except for we have a problem. We have a problem that this Pi Star, when it pops out, has no reward guarantee. There's no guarantee that this policy will actually perform well when you play it against with any other agents, even agents that are also playing a Nash Equilibrium who found another Pi Star and played according to it. It's not interchangeable. One policy does not mean I can just swap it out with another. In fact, there's largely speaking, there's no reason to execute this policy at all. But this is what we do. Like, this is literally, like, I don't think, like, you can't find another multi-agent learning paper that tries to do something else uh, beside this. And I think there's a fundamental reason why, and it's because the whole premise that I set up is flawed. So it is flawed um, in a couple of ways. But before I jump to the couple of ways, let me, um, well, actually, never mind. I, I couldn't remember the order my slides were. Never mind. I'm going to tell you the ways it's, it's, it's flawed first. Um, one of the ways it's flawed is it's separated this notion of first we're going to train, 
and then I'm going to test. I'm going to take the resulting policy, and I'm going to play it against Lisa Dahl. I'm going to get high scores in Atari. I'm going to do whatever I want to with this policy. So I go through this training procedure, and then I'm going to test. That's the first reason it's flawed, is that we separate out the training phase from the testing phase. I'm going to say in a minute what the alternative, but roughly speaking, the alternative is that training is everything that happened before, and testing is everything that will happen that's how we go through the world, right? Our training is all the things that came before us, and the testing is the very next decision I have to make. So that's a different way to look at the world, and I'll come to say more about that in a minute. So, so the first problem is that we, we have divided training and testing. Um, the second thing uh, is that this pi star is sort of, this whole premise is that it's artifact focused. The idea of machine learning is that I'll do something, gather some data, interact with the world, and out will come out an artifact. And I care about the artifact, the thing that pops out, the pi star, or the, the deep learning model, or whatever. I care about the thing that popped out, and I think that's wrong. What we care about is behavior, not about artifacts. The second thing is it all becomes very future-looking. The point is, I want that artifact, and I want to say something about what that artifact will do when I deploy it in the world. I want to say a future-looking statement, and I think that is missing the point of what rational agents should be doing. And lastly, and this is very multi-agent specific, it takes the perspective that equilibria are prescriptive. The goal would be to have rational agents that when they play against each other, that they, they will find equilibria means that's what they should be doing. Whereas the original notions of equilibria in game theory, if you go back to the 40s and 50s, was that that will be what happens. It is descriptive of agents learning rather than prescriptive of what they should do. And I think this has been uh, uh, guiding us in the wrong direction. Okay, um, let me say one more thing, and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna answer some questions that have already popped up and take some more questions, which is to say that, so maybe you've been hearing a lot about agents, there's many agents in the world, and your thought is, well, that's not the problem I work on. I just, I, I just, I just interact, like my goal is to just make decisions in the world, I don't care about the other agents. And I think that the problem that we're facing in the multi-agent world right now is a universal problem. And the problem is that the world is changing on us. The world is constantly changing. It's never static and stationary. The world is evolves and change, and whatever work now might not work in the future. And we need to build systems that are robust to that. And I think our current, largely our current AI systems are not robust to that. And I think the problem with that is because we do the exact same problem of train than test, rather than thinking about constantly interacting with the world. And why does that I entirely missed the order of my slides. Uh, this was the picture I wanted to go to. Why is that true even in the single agent setting where I'm just interacting with the world? And it's because the world is really big. That means the world from the perspective of the agent, I can't capture it all. I can't understand it all. It's always going to appear to be something else to learn. Something's just changing in the world. And so the world is very big. And yes, it turns out that it's focused on Canada, but that's beside the point. Um, Okay, so even in the single agent setting, even when I just think about one agent making decisions in the world, I think we face the same problem. How do I deal with a constantly changing environment? And that's going to be the core of what I'm going to call hindsight rationality and what it's trying to achieve. Okay. Um, let me just end with, uh, before I jump to questions, I said traditional rationality has these four properties. It does train, then test. I care about artifacts. It cares about what the future of those artifacts are, and equilibria are prescriptive. In the hindsight rationality framework, we're going to try to replace all of those with something else. Instead of train, then test, I want to think about a single lifetime. I want to think about an agent constantly interacting with the world, constantly getting new data, constantly then getting judged by what it does after it gets that new data, and then keeping to interact with the world. And I think that's the standard model for how we interact with the world and what we really want our systems to do. Secondly, I don't care about artifacts at all. I don't want them to produce me a pi star. I want their behavior to be rational with respect to what has happened in the world. I want them to constantly improve, interacting, getting better. I care about the change of behavior, not the artifact that's produced. Secondly, how is it going to judge their behavior? It's actually going to judge it in hindsight, and hence the name, hindsight rationality. It's going to look back and say, given what I knew, I'm very happy with what I behaved in the world. And I'll say a bit more about how it's going to do that. But it won't make statements about the future. It's only going to make statements about the past. Now, you might say, how is that helpful? I care about what happens in the future. Well, remember, the future always becomes the past, right? If I'm going to be happy with how I behaved in hindsight, I better act smart now, or I'm not going to be happy with my hindsight view. So this is going to motivate me to do all the right things without having to me to make statements about what the future holds, which I can't know. 
And lastly, equilibria and the end are going to return to, I think, their proper place. Equilibria are going to be descriptive and not prescriptive. They're going to describe what real agents do in the world rather than telling them what they should. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm going I'm to pause here and take questions. And I have some, which is super awesome. Um, aren't there already temporal difference models which adapt to new situations reacting to train versus test phase? Yeah, I think, I think one could view the traditional reinforcement learning uh, uh, mode of operation as not actually embracing train then test. It really is, you could view it as I have an agent, it's going to constantly take actions in the world and sort of keep updating itself, continuing to improve. And I agree, in some sense that is kind of how RL imagines itself. And so maybe what's weird is that if you look at all the successful cases, that we don't do that. Uh, I think I think it's, we're very quick to abandon that, and I think that has made us make rapid progress in some sense, but now I think it's holding us up as we're now looking to go beyond that and build systems that can constantly adapt. So thank you, Anonymous. Um, what do you mean by par st pi star? In, in, in RL nomenclature, pi star means the optimal policy, sort of mathematically optimal. That's our, like I said, that seems to be the goal of what we want. We're going to take the policy that comes out of that interaction. Hopefully that was clear as I, as I explained it more. Um, why do you focus on agents as the only examples of AI? There's a lot of progress in distinctly non-agent systems. Um, yeah, that, that is an excellent question. I think, I think those non-agent systems, like what do we do with them? when we think they're very impressive? What do we do with GPT-3 when we think it's very impressive? We type into it and it responds to us, and then we type more into it and it responds to us. So I don't know how that's not an agent system. Like if it sat there just being GPT-3 without us interacting with it, that would be particularly unimpressive. And we wouldn't think, of, of course, that would also wouldn't be an agent. So to me, GPT-3 is absolutely an agent. You might say it's not reward maximizing, and that I agree with. Uh, it's, it's hard to imagine that it seems to be trying to achieve goals. It seems to be just spouting out sensible next statements, giving its training data. And I think that's its biggest weakness. I would say that from an AI perspective, that's where it starts to fall. Like if I want to see GPT-3 do something cool, I need it to have a goal. And I think that's what's going to be the next round of these impressive language models. Uh, in my opinion. I don't know. It, I have no idea who asked. The, the one downside to this, this is super cool. The one downside to this is I just keep talking and it would be super awesome to be hear more from you. But, but anyway, Anonymous, if I did not answer your question, you can toss another one in there since all of these came from the same person. Um, what you describe as rationality does not seem to be a property of abstract models of rationality such as von Neumann, Morgenstern, or regret minimization. Wow, I don't even know how to answer that question. Uh, thank you, Anonymous. So glad I answered one of your questions. I don't know about your other questions, but I'm trying. Um, yeah, what can I say about that? It does not seem to be a property of abstract models. Um, I would tend to say that you know von Neumann Morgenstern rationality definitely sat on top of this exact idea of I have beliefs in the world, so then therefore, like, you know. Von Neumann Morgenstern as the beginning of utility theory, then sits on top of game theory, sitting on top of that of saying, well, if every agent had a belief about the world that was correct and true because it got to interact with the world and it has the purpose of gaining utility, then therefore the combination of those things would get you Nash equilibria. I don't know how to answer that question. Maybe I disagree with the premise of it. So Anonymous, if you want to toss in a follow-up since you've been so helpful, uh, I'm happy to answer uh, answer that as well. Is there anybody else? Um, and if you just want to shout out your answer, I can uh, I can repeat it for everybody to hear. Are people on board with what you think? Maybe, maybe you completely disagree with the uh, the premise that these are these are what we're falling short of. Okay. Uh, doesn't a life systems fulfill most of your requirements? Um, sure. I think that uh, I think that most systems systems fulfill my requirements. I think most training regimes don't. Right? Like if you have if you built a system that takes observations and take actions then you're stuck in the world that I described. But the way we train them is we put them in a training environment and then we stop their learning. We take out the artifact and we deploy it. And that's where I disagree. That's where I think we're limiting what AI can ultimately do. Um, 
And that's what I want to try to give an alternative to. I want to try to give an alternative to our goal is to find pi star. What is the problem with traditional RL setup? Is it the absence of convergence property if we never stop the training period and learn constantly? Uh, you're asking why do people not do this, I think. I, I think you're, is, I, I, I'm hoping anonymous, oh no, it's M. Oh, good. Uh, I think M maybe is asking the question, doesn't the, since the traditional RL setup does this, what's the problem with it? Why is it that people aren't doing it? And I, I don't have a great answer for that. I think maybe it's because AI has been, in recent, in the last few years, has been in a like landmark event mode, like establishing themselves as look we're capable. And those landmark events have to be a moment in time, right? They can't be about a behavior process. It has to be about, look, I haven't, I have a system right now that can beat the world's best players at StarCraft. That's a like, it's very event based. It's very like exciting. Will attract people's attention. But I think for deployment, that's not how we expect our systems to work. So I think to see the next round of impact, they're not going to be about moments where we establish the strength of an AI system. I think they're going to be more about this interaction is, is improving and it's adapting to what I'm doing with it. And I think that's what I want to see our AI systems do. I think uh, I'm in agreement that I think the traditional RL setup strives for that, but it's not often as we as AI and RL researchers use that model. All right, I'm going to take one more uh, from Anonymous. You said that the agent will have good behavior because it wants to judge itself well in hindsight. However, is that not just wanting good future hindsight? I, I think that was my point. I think um, the statements that my agents are going to be able to make about the past are going to be about the past. That's, that's what they're going to make. They're going to be able to at any point in time, be able to make some guarantees about how they're behaving when they look back in time. And my point is that if you think, oh, that seems funny because I should care about the future, that's what matters. And my only point was exactly your point, uh, Anonymous, was that, well, eventually the future, everything will be hindsight eventually, right? And that's exactly my point. That's why our agents actually have to still act well now because they want to make this hindsight guarantee. Okay. Um, cool. Um, at this point, the talk's going to go sideways, I think. Uh, so I want to present the core ideas uh, behind hindsight rationality. And, and we've done some really, I think, exciting developments within the space of multi-agent systems, but they're, they're awfully technical. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to stay a little bit at a high level at first, and then I'm going to try to dive technical maybe in a way that keeps people with me. But I'm not 100% sure about, sure about that. So, so we'll see how this goes. Um, OK, one of the key problems, if we're going to think about not going after pi star, uh, we're going after my behavior makes sense. One of the key challenges is that, is that, in fact, there is not going to be a pi star anymore. The whole premise is that the world is big. It's constantly changing, maybe because there's another agent in it, and they're changing their behavior. But that means it's hard to answer what does it mean to have an optimal policy to begin with? Because I need to adapt my play to what's happening in the world, which is changing. So, so let me give you an example. This, this is another uh, Matrix game, another game like the Rock, Paper, Scissors one. But what's going on in this game is that essentially winning, is, losing isn't so bad anymore. Losing is just like drawing. So this is not a zero-sum game. I don't actually have to pay any cost if I lose in Rock, Paper, Scissors. I just only care if I win. I'm excited if I win. A draw and a loss are the same value. Um, and so basically, there's just ones for getting a win to the player who played the best, to who won a, hand, a round of rock, paper, scissors. So now let's imagine, in order to try to illustrate what's going on in, a, in these non-stationary environments of multi-agent systems, um, which, by the way, this is a non-zero-sum non game here, so we're going to have problems with it. But I want to illustrate one of the things that arises. Let's suppose I just take any old random learning algorithm. Like, if you're familiar with reinforcement learning, Q-learning would have this property. Um, let's suppose that just somehow out of initialization, they haven't learned anything at all yet. They just start playing and, and you know, the first agent's playing pi paper and the other player's playing rock. Um, and so one of the players, you know, who's playing paper is excited and is winning some reward. But the other player, of course, is not winning some reward and so they're going to do some exploration and try some other things and then switches its strategy when it realizes, oh, I should be playing scissors, right? So off it goes and starts playing scissors. 
And then, of course, the first player is not so happy anymore because suddenly that rock or that paper answer isn't winning it any, any reward anymore. So it eventually realizes, oh, I should be playing rock, and now I'm beating you, and I'm getting some utility back. Uh, and that, of course, causes the, the, the column player in this game to switch to paper, which then causes the row player to switch to scissors, which causes the column player to switch to rock. And then if we keep following, we've now switched right back to where we were before. And so what we have is we have this sort of cycle of the agents changing their strategy. So from one agent's point of view, the other, the world out there seems to be this weird non-stationary thing, and it needs to sort of deal with that. But there's, there's another problem, and that is being non-stationary, it also means that its strategy is in fact correlated with what's happening in the world. Like if I try to evaluate this agent, it's problematic because it's not just doing one fixed strategy. Like if I looked at its strategy and I were to compare it, so this is their policies across the top here. I'm getting a little bit mathematical, but there's, there's, there's sort of, what are the strategies of the agents as they're changing in time? So as we go left to right, we're imagining the, the policies the agents are following are changing in time. And, and there's a column player here. That's the other player that's sort of like the world. It's changing in time too. And if I were to look at this sort of take the, 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 what is the average strategy of what's doing over time? And I were to look at that, like it's doing this weird thing, but if I look at it and try to pull out a, a policy from it, it looks like, well, a third of the time it's playing a rock and a third of the time it's playing paper and a third of the time it's playing scissors. Maybe that's what it's doing. It's just, it is in fact discovered a random strategy. And if I did the same thing for the column player, it, it would come back and tell me, oh, it seems like the column player it too is playing a third of the time for each. But this is not a zero-sum game. And so something weird happens if you were to actually play those two strategies against each other. You don't get, you get out, what it turns out you get out is it'll say, oh, against the column player, you seem to be winning about a third of the time if you were to play this mixed strategy, this random strategy. But if you actually look at the strategies they're playing, they never play on the diagonal at all. And this is true of what learning algorithms would do in this place. They don't play on the diagonal. They never actually tie. Each agent is actually winning half the time. So if you look at their play as it correlates with the world, they're actually doing better than their fixed strategy says they should be doing because they're correlating with the change of the world. They're actually being really quite smart, even though these are dumb algorithms that are playing, and they're actually getting better than any fixed policy could guarantee that they've gotten. They found a strategy that adapts to the world around them and adapts, in fact, very effectively and, in fact, guarantee, well, doesn't guarantee, but ends up getting a payoff higher than, in fact, the Nash equilibrium of the game actually gets you. The Nash equilibrium only says you should get a third, and they're actually able to get a half. So if we start taking this view that agents are adapting to the world, then I care about the behavior, not the policy that comes out. This behavior is smart. The policy is not very smart. Okay, so let me turn this into how do we do hindsight rationality? Like I said, I don't know how this is going to go. We're going we're gonna to start putting more math on the slides. I apologize. Okay, um, the way we're going to do this is to think about, remember, we're going to do this in hindsight. We're gonna, we have played some interactions. I've interacted with the world, and I'm now going to look back on what happened. And I'm going to imagine, is there something else I could have done? I want to think about a deviation I could have followed. Uh, the idea is to, to think about, is there something, some other way I could have changed my policy that would have been better? An example might be, what if every morning um, I would, I grab, right before I went out, I'm going to grab an umbrella and take it with me. That's a change to my policy. I'm going to do everything else I did normally that day, but I'm going to grab an umbrella. So that's a, that's a deviation. So here, mathematically, if you're used to this mathematical notation, I'm going to take a policy, capital Pi is a set of policies, and I'm going to transform it to another policy. I'm going to change the policy saying, regardless of what I did that morning, I'm going to switch it to, if I didn't take an umbrella, I'm now taking one. Otherwise, everything else stays the same. So we can think about deviations as take a policy and transform it in some way to a new policy. So that's a deviation. And then the way I want to think about what hindsight rationality looks like is I'm going to ask myself, of course, I, I should predict what's going to happen next on the slides. Let me give you some examples of other deviations. I give you the umbrella one. And rock, paper, scissors, a deviation might go, I'm going to, no matter what policy I was going to do, I'm just going to switch to paper. That's a deviation, right? Another deviation would be, no matter what I was going to do, I'll switch to rock or I'll switch to scissors. Those are all deviations. I could have more complex ones. I could say, when I was going to play rock, I'm not going to play rock anymore. I'm going to switch to paper. But if I wasn't playing rock, I'll do whatever I was going to do. So these are all changes of policies. They're all deviations. Um, and the key way of looking back and asking myself, am I acting rational? Is again, not did I maximize rewards under my beliefs. It's going to be, do I wish I would have applied that deviation to the behavior I have? I will, I will have a, we're going to have more than one deviation here, but I can look back and ask, 
would I have been happier if I grabbed an umbrella every time uh, uh, I went out in the day in the morning? Or would I be happier looking in hindsight if, say, I flossed every morning in the morning, uh, every day in the morning? So I can imagine changing my policy and then asking myself, uh, what would happen? And now remember, the, the, the column player here is sort of substituting in for the world. The world's constantly changing. My behavior's correlated with it. So when I apply this deviation, I'm going to ask the fact that, like, I know I was, in fact, correlated with the world. I'm going to ask, when I apply this deviation, I have to apply it uniformly everywhere. So I have to ask, not, is there some days I wish I took the umbrella? It's, should I have always taken the umbrella? Okay, so, so if I have a deviation, I can measure whether I would have liked to have taken it, and then the, the last step to give me hindsight rationality is I'm going to take a set of deviations, I'm going to consider a set of deviations, and then my goal is hindsight rationality is going to be with respect to a set of deviations, and the key thing to be rational is that there is no benefit to applying any deviation in the set in hindsight. That's the premise of hindsight rationality. Given the set of alternative changes to my behavior, I want to look back and say, nope, I, none of those would have been things I would have been happy to apply over all of time. Uh, this can handle, this notion handles the fact that the world's constantly changing out from under me. It's asking, does this deviation want to universally apply? And if it doesn't, then I'm okay with that. I'm okay with I couldn't have guessed whether I should have taken the umbrella or not. That's impossible for me to know. Now, if I could have, let's suppose that I changed the deviation to be, should I have checked the weather? And if the weather says it's going to rain, then I take an umbrella. That deviation, maybe I would want it to apply, and I have some regret for not having done it. So the deviation set is going to guide us in determining what it means to be rational. But the notion of rationality just looks back and say, is there a deviation from my set I wish I could have taken? Um, as we dive deeper into what these deviations look like, let me just use some words that I'm going to come back to. All the deviations on the left there are examples of blind deviations. They don't actually look at what the policy would have done. They just change the policy. Uh, on the right, we have informed deviations because they're informed by when I was going to do this, instead I will do this. Um, so, so we'll come back and talk about these two different types of deviations in a minute. Um, but also these Maybe you're seeing things in this that you've, you, you probably have seen before. And if so, let me just point out the obvious connections. This isn't, this isn't like a radically new idea that no one's ever seen before. If I switch this no benefit to applying any deviation set to I have no regret for any deviation set, that's completely, as far as I'm concerned, that's a completely fine set of wording. And of course, this looks like online learning and regret algorithms. And that's fine. That's what exactly what I'm doing. So if you know what those are, great, 100%. That's what we're going to do. I want to say I have no regret for any deviation in the set. And the way we're going to optimize these things, the way I expect agents to work, is to apply regret-based algorithms if you know what they are. And if not, that's fine too. Um, Second thing is if I change uh, these notions of blind deviations, another phrase I can use that maybe you've heard of is external regret. If you have no regret for any of those blind deviations, you have no external regret is what the literature calls it. If you have no regret for the informed deviations, it's often said you have no internal regret. Again, those words don't entirely matter unless they mean something to you. But if so, you probably know that if two agents actually have no external regret or no internal regret, they actually converge to something called a correlated equilibrium. Now, notice the statement of hindsight rationality never said anything about what the other agents are going to do. So it's not trying to converge to a correlated equilibria. It's just saying that if you happen to be an agent that minimizes your external regret or your internal regret, then you can converge to a correlated equilibrium or course correlated equilibrium as a descriptive property of what learning agents do. They're not trying to do this. It just is a thing that happens when two agents minimize external regret, they find a course correlated equilibria, their, their play corresponds to a course correlated equilibria, and if they're minimizing internal regret, their play corresponds to a correlated equilibria. So this was my point that equilibria becomes descriptive. I didn't say the goal is to find these things. I said the goal was to minimize your hindsight rationality, and as a result, equilibria is a thing that happens, not becoming the goal. It's not prescriptive, it's descriptive. Okay. I'm going to pause here and do some more questions. Again, I, I really like questions because it gives me a pause from talking, and then this model doesn't let me do that. So I'm just going to take my own pause for a second. Doesn't looking back for better behavior require a pretty good model of the world? That's a good point. You've hit on the fundamental flaw with hindsight rationality, as you would say. 
Um, one, one problem you could say is, oh crap, you have to ask counterfactual questions. You have to ask what would have happened had you taken an umbrella, which seems to be that it requires a model. There is another way around this. Like, I don't disagree with you. I think to do this well, you probably need to build a model, but there is a problem with building a model. I just said the world is probably too big for you to model it entirely. Uh, so there is another way out of this, which is that you can occasionally take an umbrella and find out what it would have happened. So this is the standard way, if you're familiar with online learning algorithms, that if you play bandit problems, this is how they get around that. They have to ask questions, what would have happened if I pulled an arm I didn't pull? And the way they answer that question is to occasionally pull that arm so they can find out what happens. So it's not actually requiring you to have a model, but I think you could have much more efficient hindsight rational algorithms if you had an effective model. Uh, great. So is it fair to say that the fix was to model the other players as part of the world? The deviation means you anticipate their strategy shifts. Um, I think you're right. I think that in the end, this hindsight rational view, I mean, as someone who spent 20 years studying multi-agent reinforcement learning, I think the hindsight rational view in some ways says that was a mistake that we should just think about it in a single agent case, because I think this does. It, at no point do I make statements about the other agent. They really just are a part of the world. But on the other hand, I don't think we would have arrived at this perspective without that entire foray to try to understand what happens in one of the most classic non-stationary problems of the, of the real world, which is there's other agents constantly changing what they're doing. So I, I think that one way to look at this is we should never have done that. The other way to look at it is, oh my goodness, the last 20 years of multi-agent RL just solved one of the core problems of single-agent RL. And that's what I think might be true. And we need to generalize these multi-agent ideas to the single-agent case, which is words that no one ever said before now. Um, okay. Uh, da, 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 is, is it not, oh, sorry, they're moving around. Anonymous again. Is not one of the differences that we do no longer assume that games are independent. Uh, oh, and you gave a full name. Thank you, Pevnak. Um, that we, um, yeah, I think that is that is happening in a way that doesn't make it impossible. Like, there is some... If you look at this hindsight rationality point of view, there's some things going on which seem... There are certain things that are impossible. Like, I kind of gave this example. Like, if I try to say, well, you should have taken an umbrella on rounds 3, 7, 20, days 3, 7, 28, and 33. Like... That's impossible to compete against. Like, of course I can't know that in hindsight. Of course I wish I would have done that. But when, when we have our own regret for things, when we look back in hindsight and say, I wish I would have done X, we don't usually say, I wish I would have done this really rare thing on just these particular moments, right? Like we have to think back and say, well, I could have known that. Like I, there exists a change to my policy that I regret not having made that change. I think that's what I want my agents to be able to do. And notice that we, yes, we're assuming that things are not independent. That is in totally a property. And yet I'm still giving you something that's possible for you to minimize because it's asking whether that deviation is something you would apply uniformly. And that's a question I can answer by in fact applying it and finding out what would have happened. So it's not impossible to achieve this hindsight rationality goal. If the world is changing, can we reach a state where we have no hindsight regret? Isn't that, that's a beautiful thing. The answer is yes. Um, it is possible that if, now the key way to do this is that the number of, um, the set of things that you have hindsight regret with respect to cannot be infinitely big. And as long as that's true, then you can actually drive that to zero where you have no regret for any of the things that you could conceive of doing differently. Uh, and I'll say maybe a bit more about that as we get yet more deep dive technical and it gets even weirder. Um, uh, how big is lookup of the informed deviations? Ooh, words. Uh, I do not know how to answer that question. How big is the lookup of the informed deviations? Like maybe you're asking, okay, we're going to dive into like, what are the sizes of these deviation sets? And maybe that's just what you're getting at. The informed deviations seem to be very problematic, right? I just said, Informed deviations can map any policy to any other policy. And there's like, if there's n different ways you can act, then there's n to the n different mappings of policy to policy. And n is probably not a small number if n is the ways that you can behave. And I just said it's like doubly exponential in that. That maybe looks problem problematic to you, and that is. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, wow, they're coming, and this is super awesome. So many questions, I feel like I'm missing them. Uh, what about introducing irrational irrationality? Can I consider a DV? Deviation is such a strategy. Isn't that part of the... 
Hmm. Uh, interesting question. I don't know how, maybe if you're trying to say like, is there a meta level on top of this? Then there is the sort of choice of deviation set. Like, may, is there a rational choice? Like, is there a particularly rational deviation set and irrational deviation set? I don't know. Uh, I'm going to say that deviation set is just given, and I don't know what to do about that. But that's maybe a cop out because this is early days to see if this can go anywhere. Um, just to confirm, this assumes some. Im no, they're moving fast. Just to confirm, this assumes some implicit level of collaboration between the agents. So for strictly zero sum, we cannot improve this way. No, it doesn't. It turns out that I can make this statement that I'm going to guarantee that I have no hindsight regret, regardless of what happens in the world, regardless of what the other agents do. I can guarantee that this regret will go to zero in the limit, regardless how anyone else plays. So I don't even care if there's other agents in the world at all. I could still drive it to zero. That's the beauty of this, is I don't have to make any statements about the world or guarantees that the world is repeatable or acts in a Markov way or is it non-stationary. I never have to make any statement about the world at all. And I think this is super powerful. Uh, I'll do one more and then I'm going to move on. I, I should keep track of time because these questions are super fun. Oh, crap. What am I going to go to? What, what should I stop at? I could just keep talking for hours. I'll stop when people start leaving. Um, how does the concept of incomplete information fit in? Uh, there's two ways that you could meet, m mean incomplete information. Um, there's sort of imperfect information, which sometimes those two words are used different ways. So let me, let me give a definition between them. In imperfect information is when there's something about the world you're uncertain, and you know the probability distribution of about that fact of the world, like you have a belief about it, but you're not certain which one is right. And then there's incomplete information where you don't even know the probability distribution. That's usually the two differences between them. Um, incomplete information, I would say, uh, is the harder of the two cases, and we handle it because I don't care about the world at all. Like, like it is just my sequence of behavior. I'm just going to look back and say, should I apply this deviation? And so if there's some aspect of the world I don't understand, basically everything about the world I don't understand is sort of has to, its effect has to be encoded in my deviation set. And so instead of thinking about stuff about the world and how the world works, which seems hard, I can instead think about, well, what are alternatives that I could have done? What impact could I have on the world on changing my behavior? And that's all I need to focus on. And that's super subjective and internal, but way easier for the agent to think about rather than the complexities of the world and all the crazy stuff that can happen. If I can't influence it, doesn't matter. All that matters is what are alternative behaviors I could have and would they have made me better off? I have no idea if I'm answering your questions because I don't know who I'm at, who's answering the question. I feel like I see people nodding at my answers, but maybe they weren't asking the question. Uh, okay, sure. Since there's two more, I'll do the two more. Hey, there's a thumbs up on one too. This is super cool. Okay, the world cannot change arbitrarily. Otherwise, nothing could be done. Should changes of the world not be captured by probability distribution on the set of worlds? Okay, so the nice thing again um, is if the world is changing arbitrarily, like you say, that just can't happen. And I'm saying if that did happen, then it's very easy to be hindsight rational because there's nothing I could have done to change my behavior that could have coped with it. So the issue isn't, I assume this about the world. That's the approach that you're taking. You're saying, I just know the world doesn't work like this because what would have happened if it would? And I'm saying, no, no. The, the issue isn't you start from that as a framing. You start from what behavior could I have different? And then it will be easy in worlds that are constantly changing and hopelessly uh, complicated that you couldn't have done anything different. And if the world has structure, then you will have wished you had done something different to capture that structure. So hindsight rationality doesn't need to make this assumption about the complexity of the world. It just automatically adapts to it, given your deviation set. All right, I'm, I'm hoping this makes it seem like there's a panacea to this. And uh, maybe there is. The, the, the secret problem, which I'll just give away now, is that we don't know how to scale this up to any interesting size. But I'm never going to say that again the rest of the talk, so I just... I just destroyed my entire talk, but let's just keep going. But that's because it's the future. This paper's only a year old. Um, like I said, wow, the questions just keep coming in. I could just keep answering them, but this is great. Okay, okay. Uh, let's talk about this deviation set. I just put all the work on the deviation set. Everything special now comes to what's the set of deviations we can think about. And I said, you know, this is going to get, we're going to get technical. So there's going to be some weird diagrams and arrows and stuff here in a minute. Um, yeah, so when thinking about this deviation set, there's a couple of things. Deviations is power. 
You give me more deviations that I'm going to make sure I have no regret with respect to, I don't wish I had applied them, then that must mean I'm more rational. There's, there's, there's fewer things that I wish I would have done in the world. So you give me more deviations in the set and I am somehow stronger as an agent, like I'm doing more of the right things. On the other hand, you give me more deviations and while I have a lot more computation to do to try to make sure I'm not, uh, I'm rational with respect to them, I probably need more interactions, right? Like if every one of these things I could do in the morning is something different and I have to try them out to see what would happen, then I'm gonna have to interact with the world a longer time to ensure that I don't have any hindsight, ration, or hindsight regret for them. So I have this implicit trade-off. I want my deviation set to be huge so that I'm really powerful and I don't want, I want it to be really small so that I can do it tractably. And so maybe that's the second dirty secret is that, uh-oh, you know, like what am I expecting of my agent to do here? And like I said, I don't think the agent's choosing the deviation set. I think you as an agent designer are gonna choose the deviation set. So as I walk through the next little bit, it's gonna get, like I said, it's gonna get some technical in a few places. I'm gonna tell you certain things about deviation classes. And in a few places, I wanna make some observations about what I think we learned from this technical stuff that is, that is interesting. And to get us started, let me go back to these examples of deviation classes. So like the things on the left, that is a class of, the set of external deviations is a class of deviations. They're all the deviations where you can just replace whatever strategy we're gonna use with this fixed strategy. That's a set of deviations. The ones on the right is another set of deviations. So these are two examples of sets of deviations. And you can already see this trade-off here. The set on the left, there are order number of actions of these. That's the size of that set. And the one on the right, there's a, there's a number of actions squared of the ex, in, internal deviations. Uh, and so we see that you, know, you could have a bigger set or a smaller set. So which one should you pick? Well, the one on the right does subsume the one on the left. It's just as powerful. Uh, there's nothing um, you know, that, that gives you more power, but of course you're also gonna pay the price of computation. So that's a bit of a challenge. Okay, those examples of deviation sets were in the case where you just got to make one action, but of course we're interested in behavior. We're interested that I'm gonna make choices and then I'm gonna get an observation from the choice, I'll make another choice and we're gonna do sequential behavior. So one obvious way that we often write sequential behavior is with graphs. So like sort of trees, like I have that choice at the top, then after I make that choice, I might get some observations and I'll make some other choices. So I'm gonna draw a lot of trees. Um, when I get to the bottom of a tree, sometimes I get sort of, this is, this is a return, this is utility, this is a reward. I get some value for, for, for that sequence of actions. Uh, uh, occurring. Sometimes when I get to the bottom of a tree, I'm just going to summarize it with a triangle saying, many, many more decisions happen down there. I'm going to ignore them, but there's a lot of them. Uh, so sorry, I'm just going to give you some visual pictures here. Sometimes I might talk about a sequence of behavior that just like there's more choices being made, but I just care about what's at the end. And maybe at the end is a whole bunch of more decisions that happen underneath there. So I'm going to use these pictures uh, maybe to describe some interesting sets of deviations that you might consider. Okay, and there's one more piece to these pictures is I'm gonna use some colors here. Uh, black means that this deviation, like there might be a particular path of actions that you chose to take. And whatever, that, whatever your strategy, remember this is a strategy transformation, it changes your policy uh, is what deviations do. So whenever anything's in black, I'm saying, I'm leaving that part unchanged. You had some probabilities that you were gonna make those actions, just go ahead and do whatever you're doing there, it's all good. When I draw something in green, I'm saying, no, 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 whatever you were gonna do there, you're not doing that anymore. You're doing something different, okay? So the most simple deviation class you could have are blind strategy deviations. It basically says the original triangle of the whole game, the whole interaction, I'm replacing it with this new triangle and tell you, here's what you're gonna do instead. You're gonna follow this exact sequence of behavior, okay? So that's a very powerful deviation class. It entirely replaces what you're gonna do absolutely everywhere. Um, it's also really big, right? Like if I, in, in sort of the sort of common technical terms, is the number of information sets, the number of points in the world where you make a decision, then the number of possible blind strategy deviations is the number of actions to the power I. This is a really big number and it's really problematic. Um, but it's a really powerful class. And we might wish that we could do this exponential computation, but it's, it would be hard in most settings to write down that exponential set. Here's a much smaller class of things. It basically says, I don't really care. Like, basically there's a particular moment. I don't care how you get there, but when you get there, I'm gonna change one action. Just if you arrive at Czech Technical University and Michael Bowling's talking, then you're gonna log into slido.com to ask a question. 
One change. That's it. Everything else, I don't care what you do after that. I don't care what you do before that. I'm just going to make that one change. And so this is called a blind action because it doesn't matter what you're going to do. I'm just going to change one action. Much smaller set. Uh, the number of possible blind actions is for every decision point and every set of actions. There's a, that's a thing you could change. I could change any one of those. OK, so now this is reasonable. Usually we're happy with the size of deviation class. If it's sort of polynomial and things, that's pretty good. We don't like exponentials. We might think that the blind strategy class being so big would mean I must, it must imply, like if I knew I had no hindsight regret for any blind strategy, it probably means I, there's nothing in blind actions that I'd ever want to do. It turns out it's not true. That that huge class, even though you're changing the entire policy rather than changing one action, it seems so natural that you would go ahead and um, that, that if you knew that you had no regret for any change to your entire strategy, how could I change one action and be helpful? How many people actually want to see why this is not true? Let me just do that. Oh, okay. More hands went up. All right. Okay, I'll do it. I'm not, there's a second counter example. I'm not going to show that. There was half hands went up, so I'm only going to do one of the two counter examples. Um, okay, so um, here's a game, a little interaction you might play. Uh, maybe you've seen a game like this before, which is totally fine. It's Bach or Stravinsky. You and your friend are deciding which concert to go to in Prague tonight. There are two of them. Bach is playing in one venue, and some Stravinsky is playing in the other venue. And for some strange reason, you're not allowed to talk to each other. Okay, so you just have to decide which concert are you going to. And so one possibility is you go to Bach, and your friend goes to Stravinsky, and you're super happy because you love Bach. So you get two rewardies, uh, and your friend gets one rewardie because they're not a big fan of Bach. And there's another possibility, which is you both go to Stravinsky. And in this case, you only let, you don't, you're not a big fan of Stravinsky. You only get one rewardie, whereas your, your, uh, your, your friend gets two rewardies for that. Um, but the other possibility is, right, you could just go to different ones. And that's really, like, as much as you like Bach and, you know, don't like Stravinsky, what you really don't want to do is spend the evening alone. So that's bad. No one is happy if you end up going to different places. Okay, so this is a standard game theory game that people have probably seen before. If you've seen any game theory stuff, I'm going to modify it with one extra bit. At the beginning of the night, you are going to decide, uh, not your friend, just you, whether you're going to go to drinks beforehand. There's, there, in both places, there's a lovely little uh, uh, bistro right across from the concert, and so you could go and get a drink before you go to the concert, um, and you are going to decide whether you're going to do drinks or not. Um, and so one possibility is you both go to Bach, and you have decided to get drinks, and everybody gets one more rewardy than they got before because drinks are yummy when you have them from the friends. Um, but if you go to, and that's true even if you go to Stravinsky, basically, you get an extra reward if you, if you go out for drinks beforehand. But if you end up at the same concert, uh, different concerts, and you're drinking alone, that's not good. No one wants to drink alone, so then that's not worth anything at all. Okay? Does the situation make sense? I mean, it's pretty clear you've already kind of decided we should obviously somehow agree on a concert. That part feels weird, and we should go to drinks beforehand. That's clearly the best thing to do. Okay. Here's a policy. Here's a particular, let's suppose that somehow, how you ever you agreed on this, I don't have any idea, but somehow you agreed on, you decided to not go out for drinks, but on the even numbered rounds, on the even numbered nights, uh, you end up going to Bach. And on the other half of the time, you end up going Stravinsky. So you sort of, you never end up at different concerts where you never end up at different ones, so you never, you avoid the zeros, but you're not getting drinks. Clearly, this feels like a suboptimal policy. It feels like I should have some regret for this uh, because you know I'm missing out on at least getting drinks with my friend. Um, so let me redraw this picture um, as trees again. So here, the, the 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 option you have at the beginning, remember, is I could go for drinks or I could not go for drinks. That's the top decision point. So on even numbered rounds, I'm deciding not to go for drink, drinks, and I go to Stravinsky and I get say a reward of um, two. That's right, yeah. Uh, I guess I'm the side that likes Stravinsky now. I'm not sure how I got that reversed. Um, and on the odd numbered rounds, uh, uh, I, go for, I don't go for drinks, and then I go for Bach, and I get a reward of one. Um, and so that's, that's how these policies work, right? The, the thick barred actions are the ones I'm actually taking. OK, so I end up getting, on average, a reward of two, because, uh, OK, that should be one and a half. All right, my, my slides are off here. Um, the blind action, I said, 
I said that blind action um, is a powerful deviation class. It seems so small, but here's what I'm going to do. All I'm going to do is change the one action. I'm going to go for drinks. That's the action I'm going to change. When I change that one action, now I'm always going to the left. I either get a three or a two on the even and odd numbered rounds. So I get two and a half, which seems to be better. You might think, well, what if I just change the entire policy? The problem is I can't. If I change the entire policy, I have to decide I'm getting drinks and I'm going to Stravinsky. And then half the time, we're not at the same concert. And I, only, I get a reward of three half the time and zero the other half, and that's best one and a half. There exists no full change to my strategy that makes me happy, but there exists a very small surgical change to my strategy that makes me happy. And the reason is because I'm correlated with the world. And if I replace my entire policy, I break the correlation. And this is at heart of when you think about Algorithms that are, are constantly changing how they interact with the world as the world changes, this is going to be true of all of them. They're going to be correlated with the world. And so we need solution concepts that are able to guarantee that, that can capture that. Okay, so that's the counterexample. So blind action deviations are not terrible. They actually do things that blind strategy deviations don't do. In the literature, there's another category of deviations that were accidentally invented. I suppose uh, it was some of my work a decade ago that invented them called blind counterfactual deviations. We didn't even think we were doing this, but it turns out this is exactly what we were doing. Blind counterfactual deviations have the following form. There basically is a, is a particular sequence of actions that I'm going to force you to play. And once you've played those sequence of actions, I don't care what you do after. Just don't leave your policy unchanged. The size of this is the same as the action ones. The action ones, there's, there's a particular decision point and an action, and I'm just going to change you there. Here, I'm going to say, no, 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 that decision point, I'm going to make you play to reach that decision point, and then I want to change your action. So they only differ on, I'm going to force you to try to reach that particular decision point in the world, and then change your behavior. It turns out, and this is observation number one, that I just showed you. So first, I went back and said, this is a small deviation class, no bigger than actions. These deviation classes subsume blind strategy deviation. The class is smaller. There's a polynomial number of them. But if you do not have any blind counterfactual regret, if there's no deviation you wish to apply in this case, there can be no full change to your strategy that you wish you applied. So this fact that there can be absolutely enormous strategy classes doesn't matter because you can actually find small strategy classes that subsume the bigger ones. And this essentially, if you know what counterfactual regret minimization is, it is sitting at the heart of things like deep stack. Um, that as an algorithm, in fact, was about the, the sort of theorem, the seminal theorem in that paper was in fact this correlation. It was that this implication. There's another set of deviations called causal deviations. They basically say, when you reach a particular point, don't change one action, change your entire behavior underneath it. There's a, that's a bit bigger class than the action ones or the counterfactual ones, but it too implies blind strategy deviations, which is, uh, but yeah, blind strategy deviations, which are nice. Um, you might think that blind causal deviations maybe also maybe subsume blind action, but they don't. Uh, you might think that they uh, blind counterfactual implies blind counter blind causal. They don't. Um, so what we end up with is we just have this sort of basic structure of of there's a few things that are that can cover the bigger class, but nothing implies each other. Um, yeah, sorry, that animation went in the wrong order. Uh, so given that we have these various deviation classes, there is a sort of sense which maybe we prefer things like blind counterfactual and blind action. They seem to be, uh, maybe blind counterfactual seems like the nicest one. Like none of them subsume each other, but the blind counterfactual is at least small and at least covers the blind strategy ones. Uh, so, so that seems to be a powerful deviation class. And maybe that's actually why counterfactual regret minimization was so effective, even outside of the zero-sum cases it was designed for. Okay, but the cool thing, um, there's two cool things. One is, is equilibrium classes. Each one of these things has an equilibrium class associated with it. Now, some of these were known before. So EFCCEs is a well-known in the literature equilibrium class that if you have no blind clausal regret, then if no agent does, then they're participating in an equilibrium that has a particular form called a, an extensive form course correlated equilibrium. Words don't matter if you don't know what that means. It's fine. But the other ones automatically have equilibria classes associated with them too. So when we invented CFR, it turns out the CFR algorithms, counterfactual regret minimization algorithms, converge to counterfactual course correlated equilibria because the definition is the thing that CFR converges to, which is a little bit funny, but that's what these equilibrium classes means. It means if no agent has this kind of regret, they must be in equilibrium. 
OK, um, there's also informed classes, and there's a certain structure of implication in informed classes. Uh, I'm just going to skip that because I think I'm losing your attention. So, so let me say two more important things. I'm going to show some results and then maybe wrap up. Um, OK, we're not done there. We can invent new classes. And that's where things, I think, get cool. Like, for example, here's a new kind of class of strategy. Basically, it says, uh, I'm not going to change your strategy from the beginning. Instead, I'm going to say, if you happen to reach the point that you arrive at Czech Technical University, and Michael Bowling's talking, then I not only want you to log into slido.com, I want you to ask a question. So I'm changing your behavior. I'm changing a sequence of your actions. And now once you've done asking the questions, I don't care what you do afterwards. Stay for the reception, have a drink, talk to other people, don't care. So I'm just changing a chunk of your policy and a sequence of actions. Um, this turns out to subsume all the other ones. And subsumes them by virtue of, you know, uh, uh, of transitivity, assumes blind strategy. And it's only a constant factor bigger than any of the other ones. It's basically the same size as blind causal. So I have now, actually, I said none of these subsume each other. I can subsume all of them, and I'm still polynomial on the size of uh, the action space. And I have algorithms that can actually minimize this kind of regret. And in fact, this algorithm, extensive form regret minimization, if you give it any deviation class, it will do regret minimization for it. It's completely general. It can take any deviation class, and, and it will do it as efficiently as things specifically designed to minimize their deviation class. I think it's optimally efficient, but we're not, we don't have a proof of that. Um, you can do the same thing on the informed side. There's something called twice informed partial sequences. I'm not even going to talk about that, but they too have a, a polynomial size, which is kind of cool. Okay. Whew. Could the agent create his own deviations? It feels very agentic. It feels very like agency. The agent has a lot of agency if it can create his own deviations. Um, currently, I'm imagining that as a agent designer, you would apply the deviation set and that would constrain the rationality that the agent has. Uh, if you give it a larger deviation class, then it would have more rationality in that sense, and that you would in fact be doing this. I mentioned all these sizes of classes because I think you're constrained by what compute you have, right? And, and how long you think you're going to live to that's going to give you interactions. So I think you, I, I don't know what to say about that. Um, I think that's interesting, but I think there's a lot more, uh, a lot more bigger questions of scaling before we worry about agents being very agenty. Um, how do you create a finite deviation set if you say you have no assumption on the dynamics or model of the world? Well, notice that the deviations are saying things about the sequence of actions and observations the agent have. They don't have to say things about the how the world works. It's, and now, I did describe them because it was easier to give descriptions of things like umbrellas and arriving at a talk here on, 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 on this campus. But in reality, those statements are really about what sequence of actions did you take in whatever motor stream you have, like these muscle twitches, and your observations are what you know ret hit your retina. So like from the agent's point of view, this should be going at observations and actions, and I rose it up a level for consistency. And obviously, I'm referring to things about the world, but the real statement of, of hindsight rationality would be in terms that the agent gets to experience. It would be in the agent's own experiential terms. All right, I'll do one more, and then I'm going to try to wrap things up anyway. Can you see any relation to genetic programming? Nope. <laughs> I could probably think harder, uh, but maybe I'll leave it there, and we could talk about that with questions. All right, I'm going to show you some results. Like, does this any of this matter? Um, so uh, we looked at a whole bunch of different games. Like I said, most of these are quite small games in the grand scheme of things. These aren't like StarCraft and, and big complicated problems. They're little toy games. Um, I won't give you the details of them. But um, so what we did was we took a bunch of agents that have different forms of deviation classes and just started playing them against each other. And like, does higher levels of rationality actually cause you to get more utility when you play against each other? So um, on the x-axis here, we're repeating a series of games. Uh, the y-axis is how much value they're actually able to extract out of these tournaments of playing against a bunch of other agents. And the key here kind of doesn't matter. These four here are all some of the known algorithms before. They're like in this category of, uh, you know, some of them are informed, but most of them are not. Uh, most of them are these blind deviations that were sort of in that initial class that none of subsume the other ones. Um, 
On the right here, I took some of the new ones we invented. So bl blind partial sequence is the one that implies all the other blind classes. And notice that it is doing about as well, maybe a little bit better than some of the ones that it's subsuming. The other ones are subsuming blind partial sequences. They're the more powerful twice informed partial sequences and the other informed partial sequences. And all of them, if you like the, the Y axes are meant to be the same. So all of them are higher. So when you go to these higher levels of rationalities, you get more value back out of it when they're arguing they're getting more, uh, they have no regret to a larger class of things. Sheriff is a game that has three players now, so we're clearly out of the zero-sum cases. It's not competitive anymore, and the exact same thing happens. If we take the sort of blind sequences and then we go to these more advanced sequences, all the utilities just go up. So, so the reality is that these forms of hindsight rationality do correspond to actually doing better. So I think that's, that's a good sign that there's some good ideas here, but like I said when I kind of gave the gave the story away. We still need to figure out how to scale these up to, to really large size problems. Okay, let me sort of wrap up. In the traditional rationality view, we focus mostly on train then test. We care about this, we gather some training moments and then we go off and test it in some place. We care about the artifact that's produced in training and that artifact is about the future. It's trying to make statements about what's gonna happen in the future. And their goals often are to try to pull out things like equilibria. This hindsight rationality view throws all of that away. We care about what happens as you interact with the world. I care about your change of your behavior. Uh, it's behavior-based, not artifact-based. And I'm gonna then make all of my guarantees about what happened, not about what will happen, because who knows how the world works and what's gonna change with it. Uh, and as a result, I get to stay in the world of game theory. I'm still talking about equilibria, but I'm no longer saying that's my goal. I'm just saying it's gonna arise out of behavior. Um, and last thing I want to say is that I think there's, there's a couple of different directions that this work could go. One is about scaling up to really big worlds and really big problems. There's another one which is sort of illustrated in this slide too, that I think there's a single agent viewpoint here. Like there's, you know, even if you were doing supervised learning, I think there's a viewpoint here that I think should be explored about, do I really need to make IID assumptions about the world? Maybe I don't need to. Maybe I can just deal with a constantly changing world because these hindsight rational views don't need that. I don't need to say and have models about how the world's gonna work. I just need to think about alternatives to my own behavior and say I don't wish I preferred them. And that's a pow more, potentially more powerful tool to design more powerful agents. Okay, I should end by saying this is really the work of Dustin Morrill, but you can pretend that it's mine. Thank you.